actually, it looks like it's already started to quiet down already, so I think we can just get started right now. Um, first, let me ask the first speaker, can you see the audience Does that work and the, in the screen? Uh, yes, I can, okay. which is very nice. Thanks. Of course, of course, fantastic. And just quick ground rules, or so people know in the audience, uh, because Zoom makes it a little bit challenging to ask questions like from the crowd and picking up people one on one. I, uh, I'm going to send out a Google form in the group we chat the symposium, where throughout the uh, the talk, feel free to just open your phone and put in your question there. And then uh, at the end, however much time we have for questions, we'll uh, go through that sort of um, in order that it was asked. So just FYI on uh, on that. But I think now perhaps it's time for me to introduce a little bit to who our uh, esteemed speaker actually is. Uh, Professor Steven Pinker is a cognitive psychologist, a linguist, and author whose many works have had a profound impact on the understanding of the human nature, of human nature. Currently, he is a Johnstone Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard University and has been named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world numerous times. Pinker is known for his groundbreaking research on language acquisition, on cognition, and on the nature of consciousness itself. Uh, he has also authored many uh, numerous uh, best-selling books, including Language of Instinct, How the Mind Works, and The Better Angels of Our Nature. Pinker's qualifications, uh, personal achievements, and dedication to advancing our understanding of the mind and of human nature have overall established him as one of the most influential and important thinkers of our time, and maybe you've even seen him on a couple of late night uh, TV shows. But it is with that uh, that I want to pass it over to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Steven Pinker. Thank you very much, Fazan. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. I apologize that I couldn't be with you today in uh, person, but a family emergency came up, so I'm giving this from my hometown in Montreal. I understand that the spirit of the weekend is the uh, spirit of and, a, and in particular interdisciplinary research, a theme that certainly resonates uh, strongly with me all throughout my career. I have ignored boundaries between disciplines and concentrated on phenomena, studied with whatever tools are uh, most insightful, most appropriate. Uh, when I've done work on uh, language acquisition in children, I haven't really cared where psychology leaves off and linguistics begins. When I studied visual cognition, if there were insights from uh, artificial intelligence and computer vision, I brought them in. But uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a, a case in which I kind of blundered into an area at the intersection of psychology and history. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the spirit of and, in uh, this particular case, uh, history and human nature. Let's see if I can coordinate all of these windows. Here we go. Okay. So I'll begin with uh, a psychologist's perspective on how not to understand the past and future of war and of violence in general. And that is to read the news, of all things, or for that matter, conventional narrative history. And I know that by saying this, uh, I will uh, irritate conventional narrative historians. But I'm going to begin by, by suggesting that chronicles of events, contemporary or in the past, are a systematically misleading way to understand the world. Uh, this is a theme that I uh, laid out in my most recent book called Rationality. Uh, the, it stems from a classic finding in, in cognitive science uh, that uh, if you ask the question, how does the human mind intuitively assess risk? Uh, the psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman um, famously uh, showed that we use a uh, shortcut that they called the availability heuristic. The easier it is to imagine or remember an example, the more likely that event is estimated to be, which leads to many distortions in our understanding of the world. For example, we fear plane crashes and shark attacks and nuclear accidents more than car crashes, collisions with deer, and pollution from particulate matter from the burning of fossil fuels. 
uh, much to our detriment, even though the car crashes, deer and uh, air pollution kill far, far more people than the highly salient threats that we uh, uh, visualize in the theater of, of our imagination. A plane crash gets lavish coverage in the news. The far more numerous car crashes don't. And so we think that plane travel is more dangerous than uh, car travel. Now, what happens when the availability heuristic is fed by by journalism, by the news? Well, what is news? It's uh, stuff that happens, not stuff that doesn't happen. And uh, in particular, stoked toward the spectacular, through, toward the negative by the uh, watchword, if it bleeds, it leads. Likewise, conventional narrative history, one event after another, chronicles the worst things that have happened, the wars, the genocides, the revolutions, and with a bias toward the, the recent. The 20th century gets far more coverage in the history books than previous centuries. Now, if you combine the a bit of our psychology, the availability heuristic, with the nature of news and recent history, namely a chronicle of disasters, you can see why many people have the impression that the world is more dangerous than it ever has been. What is the cure for this bias? Well, it's uh, data. That is uh, a record, to the best that we can assemble it, of not just the events that happened, but all of the opportunities for events that uh, didn't that uh, failed to happen. Uh, that is, how many bad things happen as a proportion of the number of opportunities. That's closer to the mathematical definition of probability. And then we can also ask how that proportion changed over time. That was the uh, task that I laid for myself in the uh, book that I published about 10 years ago called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And the subtitle of the book gives away its main message, which is that, believe it or not, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time. The decline of violence has not been steady, has not brought violence down to zero, to say the least, and is not guaranteed to continue. But I'm going to show you that it's a persistent historical development, visible on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the treatment of children and animals. Uh, I'll, in the first part of the talk, I'll run through fairly quickly several major historical declines of violence as uh, uh, evidenced by data. They're immediate causes in the sense of the contemporary events that a historian would point to. Uh, and then their ultimate causes, namely broad historical forces interacting with human brain systems for violence and nonviolence. So the first the, uh, historical development that I'll discuss has been called the civilizing process. Here you have a woodcut showing a typical day in the life in the Middle Ages. Um, and the impression that there was a fair amount of murder and mayhem is borne out by uh, historical criminologist estimates of the homicide rate. So here you have homicide estimates in England. The data go back um, almost uh, 800 years, sometimes more. And as you can see, um, the, even though the data is very noisy, there is an unmistakable decline. And it's, uh, this is, uh, it's all the more dramatic when you take into account that this graph is shown on a logarithmic scale. So it goes from uh, 0.1 homicides per 100,000 per year to 1 to 10 uh, to 100. And so the, uh, uh, roughly the homicide rate in England has declined by a factor of about 50 in the last uh, 800 years. Turns out that it's not just England, that wherever there are historical data in Europe, you see declines, uh, including um, Italy, the Netherlands, Germany and Switzerland, uh, and Scandinavia. Uh, here is a, um, a composite graph of the five regions combined. The uh, immediate causes, at least according to one influential theory from the sociologist Norbert Elias in his book, The Civilizing Process, is that in the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity, there was a consolidation of central states and kingdoms from the uh, medieval feudal patchwork of baronies and fiefs and principalities. As a result, criminal justice was nationalized and the constant fruity, feuding and brigandage and warlording of medieval knights uh, became supplanted by what was called the king's justice. At the same time, there's also a growing infrastructure of commerce with the uh, development of financial instruments like money and contracts that allowed trade to occur over 
uh, wider areas without the need for barter, and technological advances in transportation, such as better roads and, and uh, carts and, uh, and uh, instruments of timekeeping. And as a result, zero-sum plunder, as the only way you get ahead, was replaced by positive-sum trade, and that's an idea that I'll return to. The next set of uh, illustrations remind us of some of the ways that the medieval kings and emperors and, and uh, popes kept uh, uh, enforced law and order in their uh, kingdoms. Uh, sadistic forms of corporal and capital punishment, such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing with iron hooks, sawing from the crotch down, and impalement. But in a development that is sometimes called the humanitarian revolution, uh, there was a, a steady process of abolishing torture as a form of, cr of criminal punishment. This timeline shows the number of uh, countries that retained torture as a form of criminal punishment. Um, and as you can see, most of the decline occurred in the 18th century. Our own, in the United States, uh, the um, abolition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution took place pretty much in the beginning of this trend, in the middle of this trend, I'm sorry. Also uh, reduced during this period is the abolition of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, there were 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and strong evidence of malice in a child 7 to 14 years of age. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. For that matter, the death penalty itself was abolished in country after country. This shows a graph of the number of European countries that have capital punishment on the books from 1775 to the present. The blue line shows the number of countries that actually execute people. And bef even before lawmakers uh, uh, removed capital punishment from the law books, Europeans had kind of lost their stomach for putting people to death. The United States in this and many areas is a kind of outlier among developed countries. We still have capital punishment, unlike virtually every other developed democracy. But even in the United States, people have gotten more and more squeamish about uh, executing people, as this graph from, of executions uh, per capita from 1625 to the present shows. And the trend in the United States is for state after state, either to abolish the death penalty or just to let people on death row die of old age. Uh, as they uh, uh, appeal their their uh, sentences. Uh, also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were witch hunts, religious persecution like burning heretics, dueling among men of honor, blood sports, debtors' prisons, and most famously of all, slavery. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth. No one seemed to think there was any problem with it. The Bible had no problem with slavery, and so-called democratic Athens was a slaveholding society. But then, beginning in the 18th century, there was a trickle of abolitions that grew into a flood, which eventually encompassed the entire globe, culminating in 1980, when Mauritania became the last country uh, to abolish legal slavery, with the result that for the last 40 years, uniquely in uh, human developed history, uh, slavery is illegal everywhere on earth, as opposed to the old situation where it was legal everywhere on earth. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? We don't really know, but one that has been cited was the growth of printing and literacy. This graph shows the number of books published per decade in uh, in England. And as you can see, there was an acceleration in the um, 18th century, thanks to technology of making paper and printing and binding books. And for the first time in history, a uh, majority of people could read those books. Why should literacy matter? Well, this is the era that has also been called the Enlightenment. It was an era in which knowledge began to replace superstition and ignorance. And a, on average, in general, a literate and educated populace is less likely to believe in uh, uh, nonsense, pernicious nonsense, such as Jews po poison wells, and that's why epidemics happen, that heretics go to hell, that crop failures are caused by witches, that children are possessed by the devil, that Africans are uh, brutish, and that's bound to undermine many rationales for violence. As Voltaire said in this era, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. <laughs>
Also, literature is a uh, literacy, I should say, is a technology of cosmopolitanism, of the uh, mixing and sampling of ways of life other than your own. And it is uh, possible that the consumption of fiction and drama and history and journalism gets people into the uh, mindset of inhabiting other minds to see what the world looks like from their point of view. And conceivably, that could make them a little more empathic and uh, a, a little less um, uh, uh, enjoying of uh, vicarious cruelty. Another theme that I will return to. A, um, a third historical decline of violence has been called the long peace, and it refers to the historical trajectory of uh, interstate war, war between nations uh, or empires. In, it's most dramatic when it comes to great power war, that is wars between not just any two countries, but between the 800-pound guerrillas of the day, the largest empires and states, the ones with the power to project force beyond their own uh, boundaries. And because of the statistical distribution of wars, the biggest wars account for the lion's share of war deaths. This is a graph from um, Jack uh, Leapy of the, uh, in 25 year periods over the last half millennium of the proportion of those years in which the great powers of the day were at war with each other. That is what we would really today call world wars. And as you can see, four or 500 years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war with each other. Uh, but since in, uh, the last quarter of the 20th, uh, 20th century, the great powers have never been at war with each other. The last great power war pitted the United States against China in Korea more than 70 years ago. This graph shows the uh, focuses on the 20th century, and it shows that there is a unmistakable two unmistakable spikes of bloodletting corresponding to the First and Second uh, World Wars. But contrary to ubiquitous predictions, ones that I grew up with, that it was only a matter of time before there'd be a thermonuclear war, all-out war between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, World War III never happened, and the rest of the 20th century extending into the 21st has been something of a wrinkled carpet. Um, hug hugging the floor with uh, a number of ups and uh, downs. If we zero in, zoom in on the period since the Second World War, uh, this is the trajectory. It's, uh, again, like all declines of violence, it is not linear. It's not even monotonic. There are ups and downs. Here we have spikes corresponding to the Chinese Civil War and the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the uh, Iran-Iraq War, and uh, tragically, uh, this uptick here uh, includes the uh, Putin's war in Ukraine and the recently conclude, concluded war in Ethiopia between the government and the uh, Tigray uh, relatives, uh, which has taken us back to the level of the uh, late 1980s. So this is a phenomenon that historians have called the long peace, the fact that since 1946, there's been a historically unprecedented decline in interstate war. The most interesting statistics from the period are uh, zero, at least so far. No wars between the United States and uh, the Soviet Union, despite predictions that it was inevitable. No nuclear weapon has been detonated in a war. And there have been no, as I mentioned, no wars between the great powers uh, uh, for 70 years. Now, Putin's invasion of Ukraine obviously can't be ignored in this context, but uh, one of the reasons it has come as such a um, stunning shock and, it, and seems so anachronistic is it really is a historical anomaly, at least in the context of the last seven, um, 75 years. It's the only interstate war in Europe since World War II and the first interstate war outside the Middle East or Africa in 40 years. Uh, and it has brought as I mentioned, battle death rates back to the level of the late 1980s, together with the uh, Tigray-Ethiopian War. And uh, I'll return to that later. Uh, so what caused the overall decline of war? Again, these are some factors that historians have pointed to. The rise of um, democracy, that there is a, uh, it, it may not be true as you once was believed that no two democracies have ever fought each other. But um, it is a statistical generalization, one that came out of, in fact, research at uh, right over there in Yale University, that um, the 
probability that two countries will fight a war is drastically lowered if both of them are democracies. Um, the fact that the basis of our economies have changed in the last uh, century or so, that wealth no longer comes from land and depends much less on natural resources, but more on uh, knowledge and networks of commerce. As they say, there's no silicon in Silicon Valley, and it wouldn't uh, wouldn't pay if one wanted to duplicate the spectacular financial success of Silicon Valley to invade the peninsula. The growth of commerce uh, has, as I mentioned, uh, results uh, means that one can get rich rather than um, by stealing something, by trading for it. Uh, the growth of, growth of global and regional inter, uh, interstate organizations, the United Nations, the European Union, the, or, the Organization of American States that brings countries together into clubs and associations and gives them dispute resolution procedures other than um, bombing each other's buildings and killing each other's citizens. The international outlawry of war and norms against conquest. Again, this is a product of, uh, uh, in part of Yale, of the uh, legal scholars um, Una Hathaway and um, um, uh, somebody blanking on his name, uh, Professor Shapiro at the law school, uh, who have a, a book called The Internationalists, that um, reminds us of a seldom remembered fact that war is actually illegal, except in um, self-defense or with the approval of the United Nations Security Council. That's a big change for over centuries where it was considered perfectly acceptable to uh, press a grievance by invading a neighbor and, and uh, annexing some of its territory with a full expectation that the rest of the world would recognize the conquest. As we have seen in Ukraine, it's not that uh, uh, unprovoked wars of conquest never happen, but the uh, conquests are no longer considered legitimate and are not recognized by other nations. The expansion of peacekeeping forces, which like referees can get uh, in between warring parties and pull them apart. And in more generally, norms that prioritize human life and prosperity over national and uh, religious glory. Which um, gives us at least some insight as to what has uh, what went wrong in Putin's war in the, uh, in the context of the long peace. A, uh, a fact that I can't emphasize enough is that all the kinds of progress that I'll talk about, progress in the sense of the declines of violence, is not some uh, mystical force that happens by itself, but it is the effect of, uh, of a number of causes. If the causes are not in place, the effects won't happen. In the case of uh, Russia, of course, it's not a democracy. It does not subscribe to the Enlightenment humanist mindset that the ultimate meaning of life is, is uh, human flourishing, health, happiness, and freedom. Uh, but uh, at, with governments simply in, implemented as social contracts to secure these rights, uh, Putin quite uh, blatantly subscribes to the a more 19th century notion of romantic nationalism, that, that the ultimate good is the glory and prestige of ethnic nations, and that governments and strong leaders are their embodiments, uh, with the consequence that it is good and right for nations to uh, struggle against each other to stake out spheres of influence and rectify historic humiliations. Uh, the the last of the declines of violence that I'll talk about, I call the, the rights revolutions, such as the civil rights revolution, which, among other things, uh, pretty much put an end to the barbaric practice of lynching. This graph shows the number of lynchings per year uh, in uh, since the end of the 19th century. And as you can see at its uh, grisly height. There were three lynchings a week, 150 uh, a year. Uh, that went down to zero by the 1950s. Hate crimes have been in uh, decline since they were first recorded in the 1990s. These are hate crimes against African Americans, that is to say. And in general, attitude, racist attitudes have been in decline. In uh, opinion polls, when whites have been asked questions like, would you move out if a black family moved in next door? Or do you believe that black and white students should go to separate schools? The, uh, there's been a steady decline to the point that uh, the rates of people saying yes is in the range of crank opinion. That is the same percentage of people who will say things like, I believe that Joe Biden is a hippopotamus. Uh, women's rights revolution has seen a decline in rape by about um, 70 or 80 percent since records were first kept in the early 70s. Uh, likewise, a rate 
uh, a uh, decline in rates of domestic violence, both with female victims and male victims, and in the most dramatic form of uh, domestic violence, namely uxoricide, the murder of a wife or female romantic partner, or mariticide, the murder of a um, husband or male romantic partner. And as you can see, the decline has been even steeper for murder of husbands than murder of wives, showing that the women's rights movement has been very, very good for husbands. Children's rights revolution has seen a decline in the practice of corporal punishment in schools. It's declined even further since the end of this graph. And the victimization of children, both bullying and other forms of uh, violent victimization in school, and rates of physical abuse and uh, sexual abuse have all, uh, all gone down. So how did this happen? Uh, why has violence declined on this and many other scales of time and, magnet and magnitude and type that I haven't gone into? Um, one possibility is that human nature has changed. We're just a less violent species than we used to be, that somehow our violent inclinations have been bred out of us. Um, well, for a number of reasons, I think this is unlikely. For one thing, many of the declines are just too recent to have been products of natural selection, which has a speed limit measured in generations. The change in Germany from the world's most warlike uh, nation to the world's most pacifist nation just since 1945. The declines of lynching, rape, and spousal abuse have unfolded over a span of decades. The, uh, in the 1990s, homicide declined by about 50% in 10 years in the United States, even less than a generation. We know that environmental changes had to have been sufficient to cause these declines as opposed to genetic changes. And so the simplest explanation is that they're powerful enough to have caused all the declines. Also, it's clearly not true that our violent instincts have been bred out of us. Uh, we, uh, the most violent age in the lifespan is not the uh, late adolescence or the early 20s. It's the twos, when a majority of children punch, kick, and bite. As uh, Richard Tremblay, a, an expert on uh, violence in, in children, points out, um, it's uh, the reason that two-year-olds don't kill each other is that we don't give them guns. Uh, we also take great pleasure in vicarious violence. Uh, it's uh, one of the, the universal human pleasures, murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, video games, hockey, uh, and uh, uh, Marvel comics and reality shows. Uh, also, if you poll people on, what, on their fantasies, not what they do, but what they uh, pleasurably imagine themselves doing, say by asking, have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? You find that about a third of men and 15% uh, of women frequently fantasize about killing people they don't like. And about three quarters of men and more than 60% of women, at least occasionally, fantasize about uh, killing people they don't like. What does this tell us about human nature? It tells us that 25% of men are liars. A more likely possibility, and the one that I advance in The Better Angels of Our Nature, is that human nature is complex. The brain is a complex system. There's an awful lot of stuff going on in there. That human nature has always comprised a number of brain systems that incline us toward violence and brain systems that inhibit us from violence, what Abraham Lincoln memorably called the better angels of our nature, and that historical circumstances have increasingly favored the violence-inhibiting systems. So let me, let me now, for the, in the rest of the talk, uh, explain what I mean by that. How can we understand the brain systems for violence and nonviolence? Well, first is to remember that they are systems plural. And uh, a way to awaken you to this possibility is to just think of um, uh, any of you who own or are familiar with cats. Know that even in cats, there are qualitatively different forms of violence. A cat that is stalking uh, its prey will be crouched down close to the ground, uh, will stealthily approach its, play, its uh, prey, being as quiet and as still and as low to the ground as possible. Whereas a uh, unneutered male cat facing another unneutered male cat uh, in a violent uh, threatening display will be the exact opposite. It will be uh, 
upright on its haunches, uh, staring it in the face and screaming and yowling. Now, humans are even more complex, I venture, than cats, and that means that we've got to look at multiple ways in which humans can inflict harm on each other. I'm going to suggest, and I'll have to go through this fairly quickly, that there are actually probably at least five distinct neurobiological sources of human violence and four sources of nonviolence. For each, I'm going to say a few words about its evolutionary function, that is why we evolved it, and its most prominent neural substrates for those of you who are interested in neuroscience, and that is yet another and psychology, uh, history and psychology and neuroscience, and for that matter, evolutionary biology. So we've got three ands, four disciplines. The most straightforward system that impels us toward violence has been called the rage circuit, and it is a primitive response to pair pain, fear, and frustration where an animal not excluding Homo sapiens, will uh, erupt in a furious struggle, often accompanied by a, an ear-splitting noise when it has been uh, confined or injured. Uh, the function is to neutralize an immediate threat by uh, uh, intimidating or startling it. In, in uh, mild forms, the, we see the rage circuit in ourselves in the form of um, com computer uh, problem solving, sometimes called percussive maintenance. That is, you, you are so frustrated that you're tempted to whack the machine. In the extreme form, you get violent outbursts. Uh, you get rampages when they're, when they're amplified in, by a, a public crowd. Um, and the neurobiological implementation is um, a circuit that originates in the uh, Midbrain between the uh, deep in the in the uh, brainstem between the hindbrain and the forebrain goes up to the hypothalamus, the part of the brain with multiple nuclei for many motivational systems, and that also involves the amygdalas, the almond-shaped organs that are responsible uh, that underlie fear and other negative emotions. Uh, a, a second uh, source of uh, violence is dominance. That is. In many species, there are confrontations to establish relative strength, after which the higher-ranking individual can expect the lower-ranking individual to uh, submit to it and to cede any con contested resource. The function is for both sides to avoid costs, the costs of combat when it is a foregone conclusion who would be the winner in a physical fight, and both sides would end up worse if they actually carried it out. At the individual level, we've got the syndrome of the alpha male, uh, both in, in uh, primates and in, uh, in other mammals and in humans, and the uh, uh, frequently engaged in sport in uh, academia and bar rooms that I call competitive distance urination, also goes by another name. At the group level, you've got contests for ethnic, racial, national, and religious supremacy. People work for their coalition to be dominant over a rival coalition. There's a, a circuit that's been associated with dominance. It is, sim it is uh, adjacent to the rage circuit, but not the same thing. It, too, originates in uh, midbrain nuclei and is then connected to the uh, hypothalamus and uh, with further projections to the amygdala. The difference is that this is a circuit that is essentially who's, uh, the driven and highly sensitive to testosterone. A, a third impetus for violence is revenge, and which we often experience as moralistic violence. It uh, impels us to retaliate after some harm against us. It is accompanied by the cognitive sense that the this kind of violence we feel to be uh, not just justified, but even mandatory. It is uh, immoral not to see justice done uh, and or to let a wrongdoer get away with it. It has an obvious function, namely deterrence, to deter the uh, person that inflicted the harm and others like him who could learn from his uh, example. Examples are vendettas and blood flu feuds, uh, systems of rough justice and cruel punishments. People inflict torture because they think it is the right and moral thing to do that someone suffer for the cause that they have, have uh, inflicted. It involves a, a, a cascade of, of um, brain processes, beginning with anger, involving the rage circuit that I already mentioned. From there, it's 
uh, experienced at the higher levels of the brain, of the cortex, in particular in an uh, island of tissue uh, peeking out or covered by the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe called the insula, which just means island. Uh, then from there, it in turn stokes a complex system of the brain, which we can roughly call the um, moral brain, involving systems in the frontal lobe, like the part of the cortex above the eyeballs, the uh, orbital cortex, the part of the cortex uh, kind of on, toward the top and on the side, dorsolateral, and temporal parietal junction, which is uh, one of the areas in which we uh, engage in social cognition. We think about what other people wanted and uh, intended. That, in turn, sets up a goal and involves the reward system, the mesolimbic dopamine-sensitive dopamine reward system, also from the, in this case, from the midbrain to the hypothalamus to the uh, ventral striatum, part of the basal ganglia. This is the system that is involved in craving, in addiction, in the desire for sex and gambling and drugs and uh, chocolate and uh, showing that there actually is neurobiological reality to the old expression, revenge is sweet. When people feel that there a wrong has been done by their cognitive interpretation of a wrong or a harm, they actively crave that the person be punished. There's uh, perhaps the simplest explanation for violence is pure instrument, instrumental violence or exploitation. That is, a person is just a... Uh, a nuisance, an impediment, a roadblock in the way of something that you want, and so you just neutralize the person to get what you want. In other words, violence is a means to an end. This includes predation. There's no reason to think that the cat hates the mouse, but uh, commits violence against the mouse because he'd rather uh, eat it than let, let it live. In humans, it is the motive behind plunder, behind uh, conquest, behind uh, rape in the case of uh, sexual motives, and just the elimination of rivals. Uh, sometimes preemptively do it to them before they do it to you. It involves cognitive systems just for means and reasoning, for problem solving, in particular frontal lobe circuits such as the orbital cortex, <clears throat> the dorsolateral cortex, and the frontal poles, the the kind of the frontal lobe of the frontal lobe that's at the top of the chain of planning, reasoning, deliberate decision making. Finally, and this is more sociological than it is psychological, there are utopian ideologies, ideas that go, um, that are shared, that there is a future world that will be infinitely good forever, uh, meaning that uh, any amount of violence is justified in bringing that world closer because uh, the infinite good will always outweigh the finite harm, no matter how big it is. You see this in militant religions, eschatological religions, in uh, uh, virulent nationalism, in uh, Nazism, in communism. Uh, that is, if the ends are, as I mentioned, if the ends are infinitely good, then the means can be arbitrarily violent and people who stand in the way of utopia are arbitrarily evil. You do the math. Sometimes captured in the old communist slogan, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, um, ignoring the fact that people aren't eggs and that there wasn't an omelet at the end of all that egg breaking anyway. Here I'm taking a diagram from um, the uh, uh, Yale sociologist, Nicholas Christakis, where uh, here, this is not a brain circuit, but this is a social network. Uh, these ideas are transmitted, are propagandized. They go from um, one mind to another uh, via language and, um, and can sometimes then um, take over and characterize an entire polity or group um, via persuasion, conformity, and uh, sometimes intimidation. Well, all this sounds pretty depressing. There are five different reasons that a human can inflict harm on another human, uh, and we would all collapse into a uh, an uh, all-consuming bloodbath were it not for the fact that there are other things going on in the skull, what Abraham Lincoln called our, our better angels. One obvious one is just self-control. We might feel uh, anger welling up in us, but we can count to 10 or hold our horses. Uh, we can anticipate the consequences of behavior and inhibit our violent impulses. 
the uh, neural underpinnings of self-control are at least concentrated in the frontal lobes, and they involve the three areas that I've alluded to a number of times, orbital, the front cortex, frontal por uh, pole, and dorsolateral cortex. There's also, um, we can have, are capable of empathy, uh, particularly in the sense of sympathetic concern, that is, another person's well-being matters to us. It becomes our goal. And uh, I'll allude to another uh, Yale professor, the emeritus professor Paul Bloom, former collaborator and, and uh, student of mine, who in a book with a somewhat naughty title against empathy, argued that uh, empathy is not enough to inhibit us from violence and exploitation, although in some circumstances it uh, can be effective. The original function of empathy is to bond mother and offspring, close kin, friends and allies. But as uh, Professor Bloom points out in his book, it is not an automatic reflex. We don't automatically <clears throat> value other people's well-being or get discomforted by their suffering. Quite the contrary. It can be turned on or off by kinship, by similarity. We tend to empathize with people like us, not with uh, others, with solidarity, uh, and, and with cuteness. With, we tend to be empathic to cute little fuzzy baby animals. Uh, uglier species and not so attractive adults can often go to hell. Empathy is underlain in part by the oxytocin system, especially in maternal infant bonding, which involves uh, both the hypothalamus, the, the seat of so many emotions and motives uh, in a circuit that involves the uh, ventral striatum and a circuit that is sensitive to the um, neurotransmitter and hormone oxytocin. Uh, which then, uh, since we are cognitive creatures, we don't just feel something, but we interpret what we're feeling and reason about it with what you can roughly, uh, with the, start with the insula, which is where um, many uh, emotions that involve kind of a bodily sensation, including the gut, are registered, but then also involving uh, the parts of the brain that underlie our social cognition, including orbital cortex and temporal parietal junction, where the uh, temporal uh, the temporal lobe uh, meets the parietal lobe. There's a moral sense. We have a set of norms and taboos that just make sometimes violence something that decent people just don't do. Um, they tend to center on themes of tribalism, authority, purity, and uh, fairness. The moral brain is complex, but they involve a number of the systems that I have mentioned so far. Many uh, of the uh, these brain areas have different roles in different combinations in different psychological um, trains of thought and emotion. Uh, and then there's reason. Just as we can use our cognitive processes to figure out how to exploit others, we can use our cognitive processes to figure to, in objective detached analysis to treat violence as a problem to be solved. This involve and and share the solutions, uh, learn from those that work, not repeat uh, our errors. This involves both our cognitive processes for problem solving and our language instincts for sharing those solutions. Cognitive processes, I've already talked about the uh, frontal and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the language areas are concentrated in the areas around the sylvian fissure, primarily in the left hemisphere. Okay, let me now, I've talked about the historical developments and their immediate causes. I've talked about the uh, better angels of our nature, the brain systems that underlie uh, nonviolence, as well as our inner demons that bring about violence. Now it's time to bring the history together with the psychology and neuroscience more explicitly, namely, which historical developments are capable of bringing out our better angels? Perhaps the, the, the first and most famous is the Leviathan. As Thomas Hobbes argued, a state and a judicial system with a monopoly on violence can neutralize the incentive for exploitative attack by punishing ag aggressors, thereby reducing the need for preemptive attack. You don't have to uh, do it to them before they do it to you, if you can be confident that Leviathan will do it for you. Uh, similarly, you don't have to be such a, um, uh, a tough and fearsome badass that others don't want to mess with you, if you can count on the police and judiciary to do it for you, and therefore the thirst for vengeance can be tapped down. 
Also, by having a disinterested third party, at least in theory, the uh, judicial system, the legal system, the police um, settle your scores for you, it circumvents the self-serving biases that can stoke blood feuds and vendettas and endless cycles of violence. Because in any dispute, this is a classic finding in social psychology, both sides believe that their opponent's attacks are unprovoked aggression and their own attacks are justified retaliation. When you have both sides believing that, the violence can go on indefinitely. Another his general historical development, or perhaps set of historical developments, has been called du commerce, gentle commerce, an uh, important enlightenment idea. Coming off the idea mentioned previously a couple of times that plunder is a zero-sum game, one person's gain is another's loss, where trade can be a positive-sum game. Everybody wins. As technology allows for the trade of goods and ideas across more and more of the world's population and more and more of the world's regions over longer distances at lower cost, it becomes cheaper to buy things than to steal them, and other people become more valuable alive than dead. If you're a good businessman, you don't kill your customers. You don't kill your debtors. A third overall historical force has been called the expanding circle. That's a term that I got from the philosopher Peter Singer, although Charles Darwin said it first. Human sympathy is elastic, hence uh, Paul Bloom's book Against Empathy. By default, uh, we apply our sympathy only to a pretty narrow circle of families, friends, and allies. But over history, the course of history, the circle has expanded from the village to the clan to the tribe to the nation, to other races, to both sexes, to children, and uh, perhaps eventually to other species. What expanded the circle? I've mentioned that the forces of, of cosmopolitanism, like travel, consumption of history, literature, and drama, and journalism, might expand the circle. That is, when people adopt a real or a fictitious person's perspective, they see the world from their point of view and are more likely to feel sympathy toward that person and that kind of person. Finally, there's the escalator of reason, just the widening application of reasoning and rationality and knowledge. As literacy and education and public discourse expand, people do think more abstractly and universally. It encourages them to rise above their parochial vantage point. It makes it harder to privilege one's own interests over others, at least as if one is arguing with them or to third parties. It allows us to step back and recognize the futility of cycles of violence and to increasingly see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Um, I'm going to skip over the historical evidence and I just try to wrap up by, by asking the a kind of meta question, a question about a question. If there are a number of historical forces, biathan, gentle commerce, expanding circle, escalator of reason, why do they all push in the same direction if these are four different historical forces? I think it's probably not a coincidence, and that is all the ways of pushing back against a tragedy of the human condition, consisting in the fact that violence is what game theorists call a social dilemma. That is, it's always tempting to an aggressor to exploit a victim, but it, it leaves the victim much, much worse off than the gain to the aggressor. So since over the long run, aggressors can become victims, victims become, can become aggressives, aggressors, everyone is really better off if we can all just decide to avoid violence altogether. It may be tempting when we're the aggressor, but since it's ruinous when we're the victim, let's just all agree not to do it. The problem is, how do you get the other guy to agree to refrain from violence at the same time as you do, since if you are a unconditional pacifist, then you become a sitting duck, a, a doormat, a punching bag there for the exploitation. We can uh, think that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have gradually solved this problem, just as we've solved other scourges of the human condition, like pestilence and hunger. And what the four historical forces have in common is they've all increased the material, emotional, or cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence simultaneously.
Indeed, I'll end with one more thought, that the decline of violence is part of a larger historical trend, which uh, includes the expansion of life, of health, of education, of safety, and human rights, a theme that I explored in still another inter interdisciplinary book, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. And in the spirit of and, I'll stop here and leave some time for questions. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and sorry that I couldn't be there to interact with you in person. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinker, for that inspiring, that riveting, uh, at the end of the day, entertaining talk. Um, so we will now get through some of the questions that you have submitted through the form. Disclaimer, I don't think we'll get through all of them, but we'll do our best to uh, to as many of them as we can. So the first question is, how important can we consider science or empirical thought to the humanitarian revolution? From Francis Bacon and on, it seems like more detailed observation of the natural world has coincided with humanitarianism. But the search for knowledge of foreign domains by colonial expeditions in the last few centuries has also led to the invasions and dehumanization. Uh, how can science today, in a world where we can edit genes, be on, this, be on the side of humanitarians. Yeah, so uh, uh, needless to say, conquest and dehumanization occurred way before the uh, uh, scientific revolution. They are as old as civilization. Uh, if you just read about history from pretty much any period, it's a story of one conquest after another. And uh, uh, those of us who've just been at a Passover Seder are reminded that there was uh, slavery in the Middle East well before the uh, e even the horrors of the uh, Islamic and African um, uh, slave trade. Uh, so science uh, makes uh, makes people more powerful. That means what they can do, they can do more effectively, and that can mean both uh, good and harm. So science does uh, have to be wedded to humanism, that is the moral system that puts human flourishing as the cardinal virtue, as opposed to national glory, or uh, bringing God's kingdom to earth, or things other than the well-being of, uh, of, of sentient beings, uh, starting with with uh, uh, women, men, and children, I think there tends to be not uh, always. There are there are evil scientists. Science science has been put to evil purposes, most obviously in the development of uh, bioweapons and nuclear weapons. But the uh, many of the Enlightenment philosophers, including the American uh, framers and founders, were were science fanboys uh, for the reason that science, because it is doesn't belong to any race or ethnic group or nationality or religion. It's a, um, uh, an occasion for people to cooperate because the, the, the world is the way the world is uh, and there, aren't, uh, there are uh, good and bad ways of trying to ascertain the truth and that is a common language that we can all speak. Um, I would add, and I, I didn't um, uh, issue this quote in the, in the talk if I had another few minutes I would have gotten to it, that I, I do think that, again, there's another enlightenment theme, that knowledge of ourselves, the sciences of human nature, of, of uh, evolutionary psychology, affective neuroscience, of cognitive neuroscience, of behavioral genetics, just by shining a light on human foibles and abilities can be a humanizing process. And it's summed up by a quote from Anton Chekhov, Humanity will become better when you show it what it is like. All right, and I'm moving on. All right, and I'm moving on to the next question. Most of your analysis of historical development seems linked to the history of Europe. How does this theory apply to countries outside of Europe? For example, European, European colonial possessions where extremely violent punishment was more common than in the metropole. Well, the um, uh, actually many of the graphs of, of the uh, certainly the um, um, some of them applied to Europe simply because that's where the the data is best. But uh, but many of them do apply globally. The uh, decline in war deaths, decline in interstate war, the abolition of slavery, the expansion of uh, human rights are global phenomena, um, and. Uh, that in, in uh, some cases, like the equality for women, the um, uh, the, the West uh, has been in the lead. Uh, 
Um, in others, uh, such as the uh, uh, nonviolent resistance, the ideas have come from uh, Asia, such as from uh, India. In others, such as the use of reconciliation or Ubuntu, the ideas have come from uh, Africa. So this is, a, I consider this to be a global phenomenon, though no global phenomenon takes place evenly over the entire surface of the earth. That would be you know, a miracle. That's just not the way history happens. Everything begins somewhere. Some of the developments, uh, many of them began in Europe, but by no means all of them and none of them are uh, in any way inherently European, which is why you have the world agreeing to things like the Universal Declaration uh, of uh, Human Rights. Very well. Uh, another question. What is the connection between computational ways to examine someone's psychology and thinking, whether that be through visual classification or text data? Also, I love your appearance on the Lex Friedman podcast a couple years ago. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been an advocate of what philosophers of mind have called the computational theory of mind. This is not that the idea that the digital computer is a good metaphor for the human mind, and indeed there's uh, active debate over uh, what kind of computational architecture the mind does have, but it is the idea that what makes us smart is the processing of information, of uh, processes implemented in the brain, uh, in our case, in the brain, but they can also be implemented in in uh, silicon, uh, in which uh, there are uh, physical processes that are isomorphic to laws of logic or probability or cause and effect in the world, so that as physical processes unfold in that system, they mirror uh, the use of knowledge or logic or, or uh, math to derive predictions and um, uh, drive understanding. That is the computational theory of mind. And so I think it's a major insight in our understanding of how a hunk of matter can be intelligent, uh, leaving, of course, open what kind of computational device the mind is. Is it completely uh, massively parallel? Is it like a um, uh, an artificial neural network? Uh, does it process symbolic propositions? Is it some hybrid of these, which is, the, of course, the task of cognitive science? Okay, and um, another question. Your critics have often pointed out that your recommended philosophy of life is not as bad could be conveniently repurposed for elitist status quo maintaining purposes. Where do you set the line between optimism and radical opposition to forms of societal reorganization that might require some temporary turmoil, i.e. revolutions? Uh, well, it's, um, I mean, if, those, if, if the, the critics say that, they've got it exactly backwards, because showing that there can be, um, uh, that there have been improvements means that there can still be further improvements. That is, we are not pinned to a permanent state of exploitation or violence. Uh, so uh, even though I know that there are many people who call themselves progressives who hate progress, uh, ironically enough, if you are a progressive, you should celebrate evidence that progress is possible because that means there can be more of it. Uh, why should it be done incrementally as opposed to by revolution? Well, a little knowledge of history uh, can answer that question quite decisively. Namely, revolutions have been the causes of the greatest um, out of um, uh, bursts of human bloodletting and genocide in human history. The uh, Russian Revolution was an utter uh, calamity. The French Revolution was a disaster. The Chinese Revolution uh, led to decades of uh, genocide and um, uh, man-made famine and um, widespread uh, death and, and uh, uh, oppression. Even the American Revolution um, it did result in, in the first systematic democracy, but as a Canadian, I'd like to point out that you don't have to have a revolution to, to, to get democracy and to escape from uh, colonialism. Um, but in, in general, uh, it is too convenient to say you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. That is to, to justify violence in the short term with the uh, nebulous promise of um, betterment in the future. We just know from history the exact opposite happens. Once people start using violence, they put them, they install themselves in power. They consider those who disagree with them to be evil and worthy of uh, elimination, not uh, in including murder. Um, and so the 
uh, lessons of, of uh, history that violent revolutions are not a path toward human progress is one that we ought to keep in mind in working toward more progress in the present. When investigating the decline in white individuals reporting that they would move out of the town if a black person were to move in, how do you account for social change slash perception in this context? How much of that de a decline is a result of social expectations of tolerance rather than a reduction of racism? And is there any way to separate that from the analysis of this statistic? There is. I mean, it's, and it's a you know it's a good question whether it's simply that people are. Um, uh, uh, saying, giving the socially uh, expected response, but are uh, as racist as ever. There's a number of data sets that show that that's almost certainly false. One of them is it's not just the people approve of interracial marriage, they uh, engage in it. The number of interracial marriages has, uh, has, has greatly increased. Um, in more uh, um, uh, implicit measures of racial prejudice, such as the implicit association test of, uh, pioneered by my colleague Mazarin Banaji, formerly of Yale, and her former student Tessa Charlesworth. They have data on people's associations of black faces with negative terms and white faces with positive ones, and have found that it, over the decades in which they've been collecting data, uh, it has been uh, implicit prejudice has been declining. Uh, you can see it in the fact that people are in the policies they support. There is pretty much zero support for a return to racial segregation, that this is a global phenomenon, not just an American one. You can even see it in the popularity of racist jokes, of jokes that people uh, tend to consume in private. I did with Seth, Seth Stevens Davidowitz, a data scientist who worked at Google. <clears throat> I did a um, survey of the popularity of searches for racist jokes on Google going uh, going back uh, since Google began. And it has been in steady decline. People just don't find racist jokes as funny as they did even 20 years ago. And again, there, there's no one uh, who knows about it except you know themselves and, 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 uh, and Google. So both uh, what actually happens in history, laws and policies, the fact that we have affirmative action, the fact that uh, we have uh, an abolition of um, separate but equal. Um, the fact that people say that uh, that they do not harbor animus toward racial minorities, the fact that the measures of attitudes are consistent with it, uh, all hanging together suggest that there that the decline in uh, racism is genuine. Okay, we'll do just two more questions uh, in the interest of staying uh, at the time of our program and Professor Pinker's time as well. Um, so the second last question is that um, professors Paul Post and Tanisha Fuzzle have argued that the substantial decline in battle deaths is a statistical artifact of improved medical care for wounded soldiers. Did you overall check the causality rates, uh, 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 yeah, causality rates um, in evaluating the course of this decline in violence? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that that can be uh, possibly be sustained. The thing is that medical um, rates of saving injured soldiers are changes in percentages, percentage of soldiers that actually are fighting in wars and getting injured. But the declines that I've talked about are declines in orders of magnitude. In, uh, and uh, even if we had, um, we increased the percentage of people who could be saved in, let's say, the Second World War, in the fire bombings of um, Hamburg and Coventry and uh, Dresden, in uh, the fire bombings of Japanese cities, in the, uh, the, the Holocaust, in the um, sieges of uh, Stalingrad. Uh, there's just no way that uh, more blood plasma and better wound care could have uh, affected the death rates by more than a, a, a few percentage points. Um, so I don't think that this is could that changes in medical care could possibly explain the massive declines that we've seen from World War II to the long peace or even from the um, early 1950s to the present. Okay, and with the last question, hopefully we'll move on to more of an inspirational note and a way to look forward. Uh, in the future, and that is, do you have any advice for entering 
dis interdisciplinary work, especially with regards to ideas that are unconventional or novel? Yeah, and um, you know, it's not. Uh, unfortunately, academia is not uh, ideally set up to explore uh, the, the the best combinations of ideas and disciplines for any pro problem. But there is, um, sadly, an enormous um, disciplinary uh, um, bias. There are still disciplinary silos that you really do have to, especially if you want to be a researcher, you have to get a PhD in something. Uh, in psychology, in linguistics, in neuroscience, in history. Uh, there's also a, a massive amount of, uh, I have found, of hostility coming from some disciplines toward any application of uh, methods or ideas or concepts from another discipline. So academics can be very much at fault. Uh, I found this especially in some of the disciplines of the humanities. There are uh, this is a, a phenomenon that goes back to the early 1960s and before to documented in C.P. Snow's book, The Two Cultures, the two cultures being uh, kind of the literary uh, and cultural humanities versus the sciences, where there can be uh, a great deal of not just indifference, but utter hostility. And uh, I, I have found and I have seen over and over again that when academics try to bring um, to bridge the disciplines, bring people together into the same room and, you know, you know let, let's all get along the spirit. Uh, there can be, uh, food fights. Um, and to be honest, I found it almost all from the, uh, direction of the humanities toward the sciences, uh, that, 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 uh, many historians, literary critics just erupt in rage when data, when psychology, when neuroscience is brought to bear on, on uh, their topics. So it isn't easy. One has to look for sympathetic programs, for sympathetic uh, advisors. As a career advice, I would still recommend finding one discipline to earn your credentials in. Not that I believe this is the way things should be, but this is the way things are. Then um, from a, a beachhead of mastering the tools of one discipline to bring in the ideas and tools of other disciplines. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Steven Speaker, and uh, we hope here all at Yale Symposium that you have a uh, great rest of your time and back in Montreal that everything goes well your way. <laughs>